other room is our studio with this as an option if we ever had overflow, although that doesn't really well, that's right. Once or twice, twice. Yeah. yeah. So we wanted to spread out in here. And this show is not from our group of painters, but from Art Makers North, which is the group that Anne Rosen, the former director of the Town Park Center, started. And um, one of the Anne Rosen group of Art Makers North painters is Karen Ross. Who, um, we asked if she would come in and talk about her encaustic paintings because it's a very specialized way of doing it. Right? Yeah. 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 And um, her work was beautiful and she was willing to do it. So, um, take it away. Okay. Um, hi again. Um, I'm Karen Ross and I am a uh, encaustic and mixed media artist. And I'm here to talk about um, how I got started in all this and what it entails. And I know that even though we're in a room full of artists, not everybody knows exactly how encaustic works. And I'm gonna answer people's questions and I hope that we can have a discussion and make this interactive and I certainly don't wanna bore you with just, you know, the talking about it. So I hope that we can engage and, you know, learn more together. Um, so, okay, so I have been painting in this medium for a little, I think over 10 years now. And um, how did I get into it? Uh, I have always been um, a creative person my whole life and I always tinkered around with all kinds of things. And um, I would say, 20 years ago, I was doing a lot of crafty things, a lot of decoupage, a lot of collaging, a lot of um, hand-painted, more precious type of things, like cute things. And I um, had really wanted to get into more serious type of art. And I've always enjoyed artwork and I grew up in a home full of beautiful artwork and I just, I wanted to make some myself. And so what I started doing was I started trying to paint with acrylic and trying was, you know, that was the challenge was the acrylic paint was not doing what I wanted it to do. And I didn't have a familiarity with all the, you know, extra additives to the acrylic to make it do what I wanted to do. And I wasn't getting the texture or the, the color. I just, it was something was off and so I went on YouTube where <laughs> I wanted to watch other acrylic painters. I wanted to see, I love watching the process and the speed up of the painting and all that. And so I watched that and on the side, everyone here has been on YouTube, I assume, <laughs> on the side there was the little frames with suggestions of other videos and one of them said, encaustic painting and I remember saying I've heard of this I don't know what it is and um, so I clicked on it and as soon as I saw the first video I was like what do I need and when can I start this mm -hmm. and um, so that involved me acquiring all the materials and it requires a lot of stuff but um, I immediately once I started doing it. I just fell in love with it. And it, it just is a medium that has endless, endless possibilities. The amount of techniques in this particular medium is, I'm still learning new techniques years later on doing it. So um, for those of you that are not familiar with encaustic painting, it has its origins from the ancient Greeks and Egyptians, and they used to paint with wax um, I believe, you know, I don't know if it was in caves or whatnot, but it was a way the wax um, helped preserve a lot of the art um, in those times. And so uh, somehow it's evolved into this whole movement and here I am bajillions of years later <laughs> painting it. So um, <clears throat> the encaustic um, medium that I use is basically um, filtered beeswax 
Um, I buy them. Some people make these uh, the medium, and the beeswax has a small ratio of Damar resin crystals. Not the um, not the varnish. The varnish would be toxic to mix with the wax, but so we use the crystals that are melted down and they go into the beeswax and they are combined together. A lot of people make their own. I've done it and it's just, it's a big, it's, it's like cooking. It's just, it, there's a lot and I prefer to just buy it and be ready to go. So I get these, um, these little pellets. Some people buy them in cakes or blocks, but I buy little tiny pellets and then the pellets I can pour into um, uh, my arrangement, which I'll tell you about in a second. And then the wax medium gets melted. And then I use um, the pigment from oil paint to color the wax. And the way that I do that is that I take um, oil paint, just a squirt of the color I want, and I leave that on a paper towel and let the oil leach out from the oil paints. And so I can leave that there for a while, and then I will scoop out a small amount of the innards of that, and then put that into the clear medium. And from there, I develop my palette of colors. So it's it's very fun. It's it's very um, it's it's kind of like cooking. <laughs> There's a lot of making and stirring and all kinds of stuff like that, and. Um, one important thing is that you need to have proper ventilation when you paint with encaustic. You need to have a cross ventilation, ideally. And um, I'll tell you that when I, going back to the first you know, weeks of me watching that YouTube video and getting my stuff, I had no idea what I was doing and I was not educated on the, um, on the ventilation. And so I had a really small studio um, in my house at the time, and I, I melted the stuff, and I, you know, and I was like, God, this is, this is really strong, and it's like, I, I kind of like feel it, you know, <laughs> and so I kind of felt like I smoked a pack of cigarettes or something. So then I, I went back online, you know, you know, health, you know, or concerns with, and so then I learned about the ventilation. I did a lot of research. And I realized that this isn't going to work inside my house. So I moved the whole operation to my garage. And um, as we all know, living in this weather, <laughs> that limited my studio time because I only could work a certain number of months of the year because I would open my garage doors and the side door and all that. And it just um, that was challenging. On top of the fact that you need a lot of electricity and so I had to have my electrical guy come and redo a lot of the electrical in my garage mm -hmm. just so that the fuse wouldn't blow every two minutes. <laughs> it was really bad. So, um, and in the course of all this, uh, kind of going back to that time when I was learning about the encaustic, I also had a very different life going on and I was a much younger mom to very small children. And, um, and then I ended up getting divorced. And so the painting was such a you know, wonderful outlet for me. And I was able to spend a lot of time and just kind of focus on the wax. And uh, it was really kind of meditative in a way, if you will. And so fast forward, I continued working with the wax and then I met someone and so my life has changed a lot and I went from being a single mom with two small children and now I am married um, to someone and we have five kids together. <laughs> so life is very different. Um, one of the extra wonderful things that happened was in doing so, um, we were able to build a home together and in the home I finally got my encaustic studio with the proper ventilation mm -hmm. so that I can work year round. And so what I have for that is a um, basically a hood range that you would find in any kitchen, mm -hmm. a nice like big hood range. And I keep my paints and stuff right under that so it can kind of suck that up. But I still do open the windows and you know, if you're around it, um, 
you can you, you can sense the it, it's basically burning off particles from the wax and it's not toxic if it doesn't pass a 200 degrees so um, I think the melting point is about 180 ish and um, with it because of the resin crystals that are in there that increases the burning point of it otherwise filtered beeswax would burn I believe at about 140 145 degrees so um, everything is kind of scientific I guess with this stuff so um, and and so I'm trying to figure out which angle I want to take um, telling you okay so briefly just to show you kind of some of the work um, when I first started, I was working really tiny, and I would take small scraps of wood. And that's the other thing is I paint only on wood because wood is the substrate that allows the weight of the wax to sit without you know sinking. Mm -hmm. And it also is good because with every layer that you lay down of wax, you want to fuse it with a heat gun or a blowtorch. So every layer builds upon every layer. And if you don't fuse those layers together, you'll basically get like a phyllo dough effect. And um, mm -hmm. it kind of threads the integrity of the work. So fusing is really important. And it's also what makes the work really exciting and um, gives you all the movement and the surprises and whatnot. And, um, you know, I, I kind of been thinking about this talk and, you know, some mm -hmm. of the things that made me think about was what I realized is that the wax painting has been a, kind of a little bit of a metaphor for my life, which is true for everybody's life, is that um, it never really turns out exactly how you expected it to. <laughs> so I think that's true for everybody, you know? I mean, sometimes you can get it kind of close to what you want, and other times it kind of tells you what's going to happen. So um, I started off with these smaller, I think this is either the first or the second piece I ever made. Um, I start off just with a scrap piece of wood that I got somewhere and um, in this case what I did was I, I reincorporated some of my collage techniques that I had been doing previously and I have an old dictionary page in here and um, this is also a collaged image that I had. I used to be really into a lot of older Victorian type of imagery and I put that in here and there's a lot of just experiments that I did in this piece um, where I did some incising and filling in the incised areas with oil paint. And um, there's just a lot of different techniques. And one of the other things that is really cool is that when you, after you do your painting, you can take um, a soft cloth and you can buff it and you can get it to be a lot shinier. Now, not everybody loves a shiny, glossy finish, but that's, I love a shiny, glossy finish. And the more that you buff it with the cloth, you'll see that it gets a little bit shinier. I don't know if that's visible on this light, but I have other pieces that are more shiny. And I'm happy to pass this around if you want to feel it and touch it and see the texture of it all. So you can shine it up at any point? Yeah, and so sometimes at my house I walk around with a rag. <laughs> I'm like, you know, I want it, I want that a little glossier, and I just get in there and I just buff it up. And so I love that. But some people like a matte look, which you can do, and you can do a rough texture with this. You can do smooth, rough. It it just it's endless. And um, so another one of the cool things that. I learned to do with it is I'm really into the image transfer process because the wax, um, the wax is really, really good about receiving uh, image transfers and it, it just loves the ink. And so you can burnish any type of images into the wax. So in this case, I have a, um, I would go to thrift stores and buy old dictionaries and books and whatnot, and I would take out pages and then I would um, burnish them into the wax. Mm -hmm. And what that entails is using, um, you want to make a revert, if you're doing words, you want to do a reverse image uh, on a photocopier, and then you can take a, a spoon, a metal spoon, 
and you'll hold it down and you'll press, you'll, you'll keep rubbing into it and rubbing into it for as long as you possibly can tolerate it. And then um, a few squirts of water and you'll gently buff away the paper. And what you get left with is the um, ink has transferred into the wax. Mm -hmm. So, and then you can seal that with another layer of the clear wax. Mm -hmm. Um, and again, everything has to be fused um, with the heat gun or a blowtorch. And I'm proud to say that 10 years later, I finally graduated to a blowtorch, <laughs> which is the scariest thing to me. Um, but it's, it's really cool and it's fun to work with. And I still do work with a heat gun as well. So I'm happy to pass this guy around and you can see some of the techniques. And um, what really excites me about the encaustic is that because of all the layering that you can do, um, I like the aspect of the hidden and revealed imagery that kind of comes to the surface in some of the work. And um, I would say that the piece that's over there closest to the window, you can see that um, there are some words and things that were probably on the first layer of where I do some scrawling and mark making and um, and sometimes because the uh, some some of it is you know translucent so you can see through it and you can also scrape it back and reveal things as well so it, it just goes to what I said that it's just endless of what can happen with this wax it just it has like so many um, options you know for the person working with it and so you just keep playing and you find out different things that you can do um i'm trying to think what else well this piece right here this is this i only brought for the example of textures and, and finishes this is a piece that has what's going on in here is it's got something hidden beneath here in the pink area and um, not everybody sees it. You kind of have to look for it. And this piece also has um, a highly textured part of wax that I didn't smooth out. And then you have a really smooth part of the wax right here. Did you smooth it just by rubbing? No, it's um, when you use the heat gun, you will eliminate all of the texture if you have bumps, you can just smooth them, smooth them out. Uh -huh. Like, have you ever seen um, when people work with like resin, for example, and they have bubbles and they put a heat gun to it and it pops the bubbles? So this will kind of just release anything that's um, in the way. And then there's also, I have um, imprinted the texture of a cheesecloth, maybe. Um, so if you touch this, and I, and I love this about this medium is, you know, I always welcome people to touch it and, and you just, you feel so many different things. And um, you can also sometimes pick up a beeswax smell if you smell it too. Mm -hmm. You may or may not notice it. But um, anyway, so this has like a, a texture imprinted to it. There's an image underneath that you, you can see possibly. And then there's different textural things going on here. So I'll I'll pass it this way because I'm gonna send me everything that way. Okay. In in general, or how many layers, or is it each piece is different, no? Yeah, each piece but is more or less like two, three, four, five, six, or no. You know, I've had things that it had like umpteen layers because I just oh. I couldn't get to where I was going or I didn't know what was gonna happen. And so I'd have pieces with so many layers and then I've had other pieces where after maybe several layers I, I said I, I think this is good so it's just to me it's a personal decision and you can kind of see on the side on the edges of the painting that's a very thinly layered painting that you're holding right there it's very thin on the side whereas when you look at this guy right here this one is really thick it's not it's not finished I still have my blue paint on it but I wanted to show everybody um thickness so hi, welcome. Hi, thank you. And um, so this is a piece where um, I incorporate. I like to use kind of objects that you wouldn't realize what it was. Um, and so in this case, 
these round circles that you see are the pads from the bottom of your tables and chairs. <laughs> so I like to work with the felt pads and I also like to use um, craft, the thin craft foam that kids use that you can cut. I like to put that in and you can pretty much adhere anything with the wax medium. And um, in this case, you know, there's, there are multiple layers to get the effect that I wanted to get um, of kind of burying these a little bit in the wax. And then on the top, just for an extra texture, I did um, the finish nails, the short little finish nails that people use. And so I did back this with a little cardboard because the nails are poking out of the other side. So I'm, I'm gonna pass this around and just be careful that you don't get it, the cardboard doesn't fall out. So. Excuse me, I know you apply different things mm -hmm. on, um, yeah, but how do you actually apply the, the, the colored wax or the paint? Yeah, sure. Is so it with, a, with a spoon of some sort? Or? Th that's a great question, and I, I completely skipped over that, and that's part of the process. So what you have is, um, I have multiple griddles all over my studio. I'll go get them at thrift shops, um, or if there's like a sale, I'll buy a griddle. And then on the griddle, I have small, um, uh, what do they call them, um, mini loaf pans. So you can either use the disposable kind of loaf pan or like an actual metal one. Um, and some people use, um, I also have some crock pots, a uh, mini crock pot, a medium sized crock pot, and um, anything that is going to heat up the wax. And so I'll set the griddle to a little under 200 degrees and it takes um, like 20 minutes or something to get my whole operation running or as our builder used to call the the room the art studio he called it the meth lab <laughs> <laughs> and, and it actually was written on the plans it said oh, meth lab no. he was like what are you making <laughs> Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. And I was like, yeah, this kind of does seem like a mess lab with the whole grain and all the cooking and the griddles and what are you making? So so those so each pot that I, each little tin that I have has you know every color um, that I want to use and then I also have some clear ones that I didn't color because you always have to do a couple clear coats first um, just as a base. So um, I do the clear coats and then um, I start with my colors and I may add a few more clear coats and uh, go from there. So the brushes that you use, you cannot use any synthetic uh, brush, it will melt. Mm -hmm. So you have to use natural brushes. A lot of people use those fancy, uh, I believe they're Japanese brushes. Um, I think some of the ink people use this kind of brush. It, it's like got a bamboo handle. Oh, yeah. Yes. What is that called? Well, our, ours are all bamboo handles. They're all, okay, so oh, it's probably... But they're normally, they're animals. They're not artificial. Right, they're, the right, right. they're natural. Right, you have to okay. use them. Okay. Yeah, we've got some animals. Are we just in brushes or something? Yeah, yeah. 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 so a lot of people use brush. that. Um, yeah. I just opt for the really basic, um, just natural hair, cheap um, brushes that you can get, you know, for this, yeah. home house painting and whatnot. And, and I don't have a lot of pieces of the hair. They're called high cake brushes. brushes. Yes, so, uh, okay. yes yeah. that's exactly, yeah, yeah. a lot of the bamboo. You know, yes. And they're flat. Yes, that's a very they're popular really choice. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think I have like one of those, but just to be cost effective, I have purchased, you know, a bajillion of the. Um, you know, regular household paint brushes, they call them, with the natural, mm -hmm. I think it's a horse hair maybe, or so, I don't know what, what kind they're, of hair They're stamped with China on it. I mean, you can get like three or four of them in a package. That's what I do. And so I, I just kind of load up on that and I don't, it, I don't worry about it. And I think you were asking about the hair. Yeah. So yes, so because of the quality of some of those brushes, yeah, oftentimes, um, you can get little hairs that mm -hmm. get into the work. Mm -hmm. And um, I, because, you know, everything is molten, you can always pick it right off. Them. Yeah, and I use a lot of the tools that potters use. Mm -hmm. um, 
so I can do a lot of beating and scraping and, and grabbing things, and I'm always using my nails and hands and everything. And my babysitter thinks, she says, you don't have any fingerprints, do you? Yeah. <laughs> because I, I just touch hot things all the time, and I just, she's like, there's no way you have any fingerprints left. <laughs> so, um, it's true. So I, I, and like even in the kitchen, you know, I'll just grab things like in the oven because I'm just so, you know, used to the heat all the time. So, um, yeah, so the brushes um, are kept in these molten wax tins. And then when you turn off your whole operation, um, then they will dry and harden mm -hmm. into the wax. So a lot of people come in my studio, <laughs> they lock in and, and they grab the brush and the brush is like stuck in the wax. And they're like, is that bad? Mm -hmm. And I'm like, no, as soon as I heat it up, it'll just loosen right up and I'll be back to painting again. And so they're also pretty easy to clean that way because you can just rub a brush on a warm griddle and it'll just kind of release a lot of the wax and you can wipe it down on a, um, a paper towel and do that. Um, so yeah, so that was a good question about, you know, you know, and so then I'm painting and I'll do a layer and I'll grab my heat gun or my torch and then I'll fuse it and then I'll go back and I'll do some more layers and it's just a continuous painting, fusing, painting, fusing. You always have to stay fusing. And then in the fusing, you can do a really subtle kind of quick fusing. Um, or if you really keep that heat on there, it's gonna move the wax around. And so that's when things happen. Like this is actually an example in this painting where the motion you know, of the paint kind of going around was because the heat was kind of pushing things around. Mm -hmm. And this is a great example where I don't really have a lot of control. It just, I just kind of let it do its thing and then I just step back and stop doing it <laughs> and see if that works. So, um, And yeah. how long does it take when, yeah, I suppose depending on the layer, how thick, but in between what, when you have one layer and then you want to put the second one, do you have to wait until it dries or? It dries instantly. Oh. So it can dry if you're the larger surface you're working on. Let's say I'm like priming with a clear coat and I start here. By the time I get to the middle, it's already dry. Oh. So for me to continue the row, I might have to redip to get the other side painted. Oh. So with, with tiny things like this, I can just do one sweep and it'll do that. So it's as soon as it's dry is when you're going to reheat it and fuse it in there. Oh. Ah, so every time, every two layers, you have to heat so that you can put... Yes, you don't oh. want to put a new layer on until you fuse whatever you put down. Also, so the new layer is part of the old layer. Right. Uh, so all... you don't put... The, there's one layer, you don't put something on top, and then you get... No, it's so it becomes part of the layer below. Right. And, uh. and some people, like some artists, I, you know, I read about this quite a bit, some artists feel like, oh, you don't have to fuse every layer. And other encaustic people would say, no, you really should because it really um, strengthens the, the piece and um, you don't want it to be falling off or chipping or just not, you know, being used, really. So, um, what if you want the second layer to fuse into the first layer? to get something you know, funky going on. Do, can you do that? You said once it dries, then you can put another layer on, but what if you want that second layer to go into and mix with the first layer? Is that possible? Yeah, you yeah. keep the heat on it. Okay. And like this is an example of that. So I just kind of did brush strokes of different colors here, and then I held the heat to it, and I let those layers play with each other and kind of you know, work with each other. So when you say heat, we're talking about a uh, handheld blowtorch. Heat gun or blowtorch. So and like how close, how close are you? I would like say, pennies, like say or? this is my heat gun. Yeah. I'm about like this. Oh, no, like six inches. Pretty close. Yeah. Yeah. That's about six um, inches. Sometimes if you don't want things to move too much, you might want to be a little further away because especially with the image transfer, um, what happens is if you hold the heat to the words, 
the words start to kind of go like this, <laughs> and so, which actually looks cool. But if you don't want that to happen, you really need to give it a quick shot, a little blast of heat, and kind of seal that in. So, um, I mean, and in terms of like um, the style of work that I do, um, I, I, I brought these examples from different chapters of my painting life. Um, I oftentimes do really colorful, vibrant things like this, as in like the one there, there's just a lot going on. And then other times I might do, you know, a quieter piece that has, you know, maybe just a few soft colors in it. That's okay. Um, and then I also have these um, moments where I go kind of dark and tribal. And so this is kind of an example of that. Um, and this piece has, um, you would never know, but these are, this is the foam craft that the kids use often, that thin foam craft you can cut into. And um, there are multiple layers of the darker colored wax in here. And then after I build all of that up, I, um, I take a tool and I incised all of these holes into the wax. Oh. And then after those holes are, you know, dug, so to speak, I take regular oil paint and um, that's not leached out or anything like that, just regular oil paint. And I will wipe oil paint all over the painting until it gets into all the holes that I wanted to. And sometimes that takes a few passes. But um, the wax allows for you to be able to wipe off anything you want to. Mm -hmm. So um, at first, when you lay the oil paint down, you're like, oh, mm -hmm. I just ruined my painting with all this gold paint. And, and then you just keep plugging away at wiping it down. Mm -hmm. And eventually, you come back to the original dark colors that you had. and. Um, I, again, it's just another technique that I find really exciting that you can do with it. The wax itself is pretty durable, sturdy, and it's impervious to water, and um, you can't mix it with acrylic, so it's uh, it, it, it's wipeable. <laughs> so it's, it would be good for like a high moisture place, too. What you, what's your very first layer? I mean, okay. You don't need to gesso these, right? Right. Well, you're, you want to start with a clear coat. You want to oh, start with the, the, the on wax. The wood. On yeah, the wood. on the wood. But right. before I do that, in many cases, including the one on the end there, I'll often do my mark making. Yeah. Uh, so right on the wood. Right on the wood. Mm. So you can use, um, you know, any kind of pencil, charcoal. Um, you can, I've also used um, that copy paper, you know, when you, you use that 